Over the years, I have made almost all sweets with honey, which is one and a half times sweeter than sugar, and also one and a half times more calories, so it's no real trade-off there, you know. But I just prefer honey. I trust it more. It hasn't gone through agribusiness, you know. That's a reason to trust. And nowadays, unless you're getting, specifically you're sure you're getting cane sugar, it's genetically engineered. The beets are genetically engineered, so don't really trust granulated sugar at all. So I've always used honey, and I've always cut the recipes in half at least. And over the time, we'll cut a recipe in half, we'll eat it and say, boy, it doesn't have to be that sweet. And we'll often cut it by another 20%. And indeed, I've done all kinds of cooking for very mainstream audiences, um, and had them say, can I have the recipe for that? I love that. And I, I thought, the recipe I kind of just made up. I can't really think what it is and all that. And so I'm trying to figure out how to give them this recipe. And they go, I just love that it wasn't so sweet. And I can say, real simple, cut the sugar in half. You know, automatically, I don't think you can ever fail cutting the sugar in half. I think you'll think it's plenty sweet enough. So that right there is a great start. You know, just cut the sweetener in half and then taste it and see if you need it to be even that much. And then the next trick that I've learned over time, which allows me to cut even more, is to put a very small amount, for me, of stevia in. Somebody said that the least aftertaste stevia that they knew was Trader Joe's, and I kind of agree. So I buy Trader Joe's stevia extract. Don't use very much. I basically, all of these recipes had some place between a 16th and a 12th of a teaspoon. But that's enough, it's strong enough, to allow you to cut back considerably on the sugar and for me, not to get the, most people say bitter taste, to me it's a licorice taste. And I just don't like it. You know, I guess, I guess it finishes bitter, but the upfront licorice is what really bothers me. Um, and so I purposely use it so that it adds the sweetness, but doesn't add that aftertaste. If you don't mind the aftertaste, then you can go with way more stevia. And something else I figured out a long time ago, the recipes always have you putting sugar in the biscuits, sugar in the crust. I don't need it. I just leave it out. For this recipe, because the whole thing is supposed to be sweet, I put a twelfth of a teaspoon of stevia in the crust, and that'll be fine for me. You know, if you're doing strawberry shortcake, you have to put some kind of sweetener on the strawberries to draw the juice out, to make it juicy, to have it work. So that's been sweet, and the strawberries hopefully are sweet, though not always. Um, and then the whipped cream can be sweetened. And what I love about whipped cream is that you can adjust your sweetness. In the pie, we have... Um, Rice syrup, rice syrup, this guy right here, is my perfect replacement for corn syrup. It works great, works the same way. You know, gets nice and thick, way less sweet, way less sweet, not GMO. So I go with rice syrup for that kind of thing. So for the top, the, what he calls the, um, the pecan syrup on top, it's rice syrup, and then way, way less sugar than he calls for, I think I have like you guys are looking at the recipe. I think I have like a, a tablespoon or maybe even just a teaspoon of coconut sugar in there for that. Um, and then once again, just about a sixteenth of a teaspoon of stevia. Um, and then that's for the syrup that went on top. Then the, the sweet potato part, they were pretty sweet, so I didn't need to put nearly as much sweetness in there either. You know, like I think he wanted a quarter cup. I put a tablespoon of um, coconut sugar in there. And then once again, about a sixteenth of a teaspoon of um, stevia. Also, it's good to know that both cinnamon and vanilla evoke sweetness. They may not actually be sweet, but we are, it adds to our, our sweet satisfaction to have them in there. And both of those were called for in this recipe. I'll sometimes add vanilla in just because it does that. And it has calories in the vanilla if it's alcohol, but they should mostly be gassing off when they get heated um, because it, it's volatile. Um, so anyways, that's what inspired this, and that's a good example. And that actually, I had to do that one because it's an example of a recipe that's impossibly sweet for me that I think is very satisfying, still not being that sweet at all. And then I didn't even bring in this, actually. If anybody wants it, I could post it online or something. But he put something called Chantilly cream on top, which I'm sure is incredibly sweet, too, and I just don't even need it, you know? I just don't even need to go there. I'm quite happy with the pie without that. I want you all to see what the different sweeteners taste like. And so I made a batch of cookies. I put different sweeteners in each one. So I, I mixed up everything except for the butter and the sweetener. You cream the sweetener into the butter. And then I mixed that recipe into these. First time I did it, 
was way too wet. I had to bake them all over. You know, I would have left at 430 and maybe missed all that traffic if I wasn't baking them over again. Um, they just spread out all over the pan, with the exception of the one that had the white stevia. You know, I called for four, four tablespoons extra if you're using a liquid sweetener. I actually put five tablespoons in just to be sure that they didn't spread on me so they'd work. I'd back at least that one tablespoon out. You might be able to back two out. It really should be that they're thick enough that you have to work a little bit to flatten them. Not much, but you, know, you can't just go and they spread out. That's what they were like the first time. You know, they have to take a little bit of pressure to flatten them, and that's about, about how it's right. You know? um, so that's probably where we'll start. We'll start tasting these. First we're gonna, one we're going to do is probably the least sweetener. That's rice syrup. Rice syrup, two tablespoons, is 75 calories. So it's way low in calories. Sweet enough for you? I think this is good. Well, that is actually the very lowest, the least sweet thing, and probably the best for you. Years ago, I owned a bakery, and a man named Tom Athos and Debbie Athos had a, co a company. They did macrobiotic products, and they asked me to make a macrobiotic um, granola for them. And it was based on rice syrup. And he said, what did you think of when I ate it? I said, Tom, I thought it was pretty Spartan. He said, Spartan, what's that? And I'm like, Tom, you don't know what Spartan means? He said, joke, Pat, macrobiotic. <laughs> Macrobiotics is really pretty Spartan, you know, I didn't get it. Okay, so that's that one. These are honey. Hopefully this will be sweet enough for you. Anybody that's not sweet enough for? I have to confess that I don't notice major differences besides sweetness. With these, with these, do, do, do other people notice anything different besides that? I can taste the honey in that one. You can uh -huh. tell that it's honey, but it's, I mean, the sweetness is perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I like the taste of honey. I mean, that's basically what I bake with this honey. You know? Okay, now we're gonna do um, malt. <clears throat> this should be, have a different flavor profile too, I would assume. Malt is a pre predominant flavor. It's also, by the way, supposed to crisp up better. And then the last one we're gonna do is coconut sugar. Coconut nectar, I'm sorry, not sugar. There's, we have both here, okay? This is the nectar, this is the sugar. So did you notice a difference in the malt? Did you get a malty flavor in it? Yeah, sort of, I thought it was good. You liked it? You don't like it? It's also less sweet. But yeah, I can definitely taste the malt. So once again, you could just, because it's a lower calorie one, you could use or you could add a little more stevia and get it to a sweetness that you want it. You know? So all of these can work. And one of your handouts gives you a, a formula for how to deal with the moistness of them. The runnier they are, the more you go to the high end of the, the extra flour to add. The thicker they are, like the rice syrup, the more you can stay on the low end. The trick to being successful with these would be to do a couple batches and dial in the, the flour perfectly and then dial in the baking too, because each one of these, if you were to look at these, they have different darknesses because each sugar browns at different temperatures. I make sweets these days for events and for the holidays. And otherwise, I haven't got time for it and I'm not that interested in them anyway, so I don't you know, make them. And so I haven't got them all dialed in, but I have done lots over the years. I owned a bakery and you know, I worked for various restaurants and stuff, so I've done a lot and I know that just playing with them a little bit, you can dial them in more. But actually for this class, it's better for me not to have them dialed in to actually be able to talk about the process because that's what you really want to take home from here. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I think that's a real special recipe. You know? And I actually like the gingerbread recipe from Laurel's um, Kitchen too. Laurel's Kitchen, by the way, I meant to bring that book with me and I forgot to take it. I highly recommend that book. It's old now, it's from the 70s. You know, and so some of the science is wrong. I mean, she may even recommend trans fats in there, I don't remember, but you know, that's where the science was back then, you know, but overall her attitude towards food is really like, let's make it as whole as it can be and let's have the information we need so we can do what we want to do and not be in a box of just a recipe. And then at the back, there's a whole bunch of charts that actually tell you the caloric content and the mineral content of each food. And so I refer to those all the time. I'm sure I can look them up online, but it's actually faster, believe it or not, to look in the book. And I trust Laura more than I do a lot of internet sources, so. I recommend that book a whole lot. Okay, so this one here is interesting. And this one, we're gonna steal a little bit of Mayor's whipped cream for this. I did this, I had to go to a memorial service this weekend, and it was a potluck. 
And even though the person we were remembering didn't much like sweets at all, I made a great big squash dish, but I also figured I might as well practice baking. So I made a gingerbread and it was on the spur of the moment. I didn't have the ingredients I would have liked to have had. It calls for either orange juice or yogurt. So our buttermilk, I used yogurt instead. If you were trying to figure out how to use as few sweets as possible, which of those two do you think you would use? I, I'd go with the orange juice, you know? It's like you're adding a little bit of natural sweetness, you know? And more than that, the buttermilk is sour and you gotta counteract it, you know? So that's why I'd go with the orange juice. I also thought, and indeed if I'd had time, I would have, I would have made some and tried to batch that way too, that making applesauce and using applesauce instead would have worked great, you know? Um, applesauce is a natural sweetener. By the way, bananas too. I mean, I've, I've ever been on a kick where I wanted to have muffins for breakfast, but I didn't want it to be real sweet. So I would just mash up bananas and use a teeny drop of, of stevia, and that's all I needed. That was sweet enough, you know? I've ever made banana bread that way too. So this one here is an okay gingerbread. I actually am not that excited by it, um, but I think with a little bit of whipped cream, it'd be fun. So we got three servings we're doing, right? Okay. And if you can just put a little dollop of whipped cream on a part of it and then not on the other part, okay? So they can try both, both ways, okay? Okay, and so once again, a small amount of stevia. And I went with molasses for this one because that's, you know, it's, it's gingerbread, you know, so molasses is gonna work. But if for some reason, I mean molasses is actually probably more processed than like honey or something. So you might decide to use like one, she says in the book, which I don't know if I added in, um, that you could use a third of a cup of black strap molasses. This is just dark molasses. I guess I didn't bring that one either, but that, you can see, you can find it downstairs. Um, you could use just a third of a cup of black strap molasses and the rest honey. And that would give you that molasses kick but you would have the um, more enjoyable flavor of the honey and more minerals, um, less processed. I mean, you know, blackstrap is way high in minerals, I guess, depending on where it's made. Turns out it has to do with the actual equipment it's made in, how many, how many minerals are there in it and stuff too. But, um, you know, for me, the molasses is the flavor I want. A um, Couple other things to say about that recipe. It called for mustard powder, but in this situation, the sweetener is liquid and I'm cutting it way back. So I, I use prepared mustard. Prepared mustard gives me a little bit more liquid and it works just as well. And that mustard is about giving it a little bit of extra bite. It's not uncommon to put mustard in, in gingerbread. You could have different people you're cooking for and somebody you know, may be diabetic and yet they still wanna have some dessert. This one would be pretty okay for a small amount you know, if they're balancing their things otherwise and they would not have the whipped cream. You know, and then everybody else could just throw as much whipped cream on as they want and then they get away with it. Another thing you could do with this um, is cut it in, the, in half and put sweetened cream cheese between it. And that'd be very good too. And then, you know, literally you could actually have it that you did, you know, sweetened cream cheese and more sweetened cream cheese. 60 minutes is sugar toxic. Anybody ever see that one? When I'm done with this class, I'm gonna do one of my Oh, I'm clean and pure things. When you see, if you see that video, whoo, I mean, it's, it's pretty scary the things that sugar can do. I mean, you know, um, apparently it's, it's mainline and right to tumors, you know? It's like super tumor food. They love that glucose and they just blow up with it, you know? And it also converts the excess, anything your liver can't use converts right away to the bad cholesterol, you know? So, and then they had a couple other things in there too. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they, so I was like, oh yeah, I need to be reminded, it's time to back off the sugar, you know. Um, I don't need a lot anyways, but I really don't need any of it, you know. Um, and so that was a good lesson for me. Okay, so I came back from that class and I thought, well, I'm definitely using the orange juice. And I put too much flour in it, trying to compensate. You know, I didn't, I didn't compensate for how much liquid I pulled out, you know. So I, I, I changed it and I put a lot less flour in the one that we made with the orange juice. Um, I'm trying to think, was there any other things I did different? I don't think so, I think those are the two changes. Um, and so we'll try that one next. 
Essentially, there's nothing particularly hard about doing the low sugar. It's not like you have to do more work. You know, I mean, for, the, for this one, I did actually juice oranges. I had some fresh oranges, so that was more work. But I didn't have to. I could have bought orange juice, you know. Um, I could have used um, store-bought applesauce. Um, there's lots of ways you can do it. OK, and this one here, I'm going to give it to you without the whipped cream. If you all want to try it with the, with the whipped cream, I'll give you another piece. And you can try it again. I don't think it needs it. You can tell me. And so for a gluten-free person, you can make all your other recipes the same. I mean, really, the sugar part is the same, you know? But indeed, I just, I didn't have time to experiment and develop gluten-free recipes for this, so I didn't bother, you know? I didn't expect anyone to be here that was gluten intolerant either. Well, no, it's pretty common these days. I mean, we, for, from when we make meals for our classes, we always have a gluten-free, um, you know, gluten-free recipe. So I'll be interested to see if this one is sweet enough for you without the whipped cream. I like it even more with whipped cream, though. Yeah. Um, so basically, both the cookies and the um, gingerbread, pretty quick desserts, pretty easy. Um, the pie, that's not a quickie. That takes a little bit of time, a little bit of thought. But it's a great celebratory one. I will, I'll often make it for Thanksgiving if I'm bringing it. If I'm bringing a dessert to a potluck, you know. Your second gingerbread, what was it? Sweetener. It was molasses. But it also had orange juice, okay. which added the sweetness, you know. And I mean, for all of them, it was, it's always someplace between a 16th and a 12th of stevia. That's pretty much my standard, you know. I want to be sure I don't get that taste out. Did anybody notice the stevia? Oh, yes. Right, see, I only use enough that I ramp up my sweetness, but you don't notice it. That's always my goal, you know. I want the extra sweetness, but I don't want that. So, you know, I could add a lot more and make it considerably sweeter. But then I get that aftertaste. I just don't want it, you know? So I don't go there. But I, th I highly recommend small amounts. It really makes a difference. And really, I should have done with and without the stevia, so you could have seen that. What is the advantage of using just a little bit of stevia, stevia rather than more of the other one you're using? More of the other sweetener? The stevia has no calories. I mean, it's actually pretty sweet overall because there's sweetness in everything in it, you know? And you're using sweet potatoes, which I reckon, by the way, if I'd had all the time in the world, enjoy of cooking, there's a recipe for carrot cookies. And the bulk of the cookie is, pure, is cooked pureed carrot. I just switch sweet potato out. And you bake an extra sweet potato, you put that in there instead of the carrots, I guarantee you it'd be a great cookie, you know? Um, and of course, you'll need very little sweetener because the sweet potatoes are so sweet, usually, if baked properly. Yep, that's about how I like it to be. If I was having to cook for somebody that needed to use less sugar, I think I could still make this be good with less sugar than what's in this, actually. Yeah. Um, but that is the, the real celebratory one, you know? Um, and so I don't mind it being a little sweeter. There's no regular sugar in any of this. None at all. None. Um, none's needed, you know? I mean, I. I have a bag, so when family comes and they want sugar for their coffee, I have a bag of organic sugar because they want the straight sugar, and so it's there for them. I've had the same bag for years now. It's actually in a jar, so it doesn't get you know turned to something I can't use. The sweet potato filling on the first recipe calls for two tablespoons of sugar. So what kind of sugar is that? Um, okay, the sweet potato, the first recipe, I'm not, I'm not actually encouraging you to make that at all. That's just for you to compare and see how I changed it. That's just pure white sugar. Everything Paul Perdone does is, is GMO, pure white as it can be, you know? So it's corn syrup, it's white sugar made from beets, I'm sure, you know? He's not, you know, he, that's not his concern at all. And indeed, it's an old book. I mean, the book was actually, I used that book in Berkeley in the early 80s, you know? So it's, it's definitely an old book. Um, so I, you know, don't worry about, I, I'm not really gonna talk to you about how to make that recipe. You can easily figure it out if you want, if you want to just make a super sweet one. Um, the one that I recommend is the second one, but I left off the, or I didn't leave off, the computer chopped off the, um, the syrup. So the syrup is the same recipe, except we cut the, the, the corn syrup down to seven tablespoons plus two teaspoons, okay? And then we cut the sugar from three quarters of a cup to one tablespoon of the um, 
coconut sugar. And you could use any, you could use something else if you didn't want to use coconut sugar. Use more stevia, you know. But I went with something dry there. I just needed, I wanted to have that syrup be thick enough, you know. Um, and then I added my always to everything, sixteenth of a teaspoon of um, stevia, and that's it. And otherwise, the recipe is the same. I didn't change anything else in it. It's done the same way. Okay, I just chopped the, the sweeteners way down, and it worked fine. You know, I didn't need all that sweetener. Um, and basically, that's the recipe. And the cookies, I don't recommend that you do all these different ones. You choose one sweetener and do it, of course. I just did all these so you could taste the different ones, see the different flavor profiles, and decide which one you want it, you know? You're probably gonna pass on rice syrup and malt, you know? But the other ones probably work for you. It's use one of those, not all of them. <laughs> Boy, will it be sweet if you use them all. <laughs> and you'll need to add an awful lot of tablespoons of flour to compensate for the liquid. <laughs> it really won't, you'll have far more cookies than you planned on. Okay, so that's basically my strategy, you know, and so other strategies I've kind of mentioned, and that is to use things that are naturally sweet. That was Mayor's um, direction too, like, you know, when I have a chance, you know, if an ingredient is some kind of a um, fruit or vegetable, <clears throat> I'll look for a sweeter one and I'll add it in. Always go with whole grain. You know, I only did half and half for Paul Perdome because, you know, it's Paul Perdome, but otherwise I go with whole grain. And I don't know if I got the science right on this or not, I know that we're better off using sweeteners that have fiber. You know, that, so fruit's better for us because it's got fiber in it. And so I'm assuming that if the dish has fi more fiber, we're gonna assimilate the sweeteners more slowly too. I don't know if that's true. Since I'm fine with whole wheat, especially in sweets, I don't even notice the difference, right? Um, I just always go with whole wheat, you know, or you could go with whole buckwheat, you know, or another whole grain. But I'd recommend, if you're willing to do with it, go with the whole grain, you know, at least, you know, basically none of us are eating sweets because they're good for us, right? So the goal is to make them as not bad for us and have as much that's good for us as possible in them, you know? So I picked a cookie that's got oats in it. That's just more fiber. It actually called for chocolate chips. I used raisins, you know? It's just like the raisins add sweetness <clears throat> and they're not a processed food, you know? I recommend organic. You know, stay away from conventional raisins if you don't if you don't want if you want to be if you don't want to eat pesticides because they're one of the more poisoned um, foods. So I think it's worth the money for organic for those. But that's basically um, my strategy. I I will say that in none of these recipes that I try to reduce the fat. There isn't significant fat in the gingerbread. Um, there's a, there's butter, but it's not that much. It's like three tablespoons or something. But the other ones, all of these are significant fat and. If you're trying to get healthy, you might also try to reduce the fat. If you do that, you probably really do want to have something like sweet potato or applesauce or something in there because it's going to be dry. And dry and not so sweet, kind of like that first gingerbread, right? Not so sweet, dry, probably not your favorite gingerbread. It wasn't my favorite gingerbread, that's for sure, you know? And how to get better, I just used orange juice. And that added the sweetness, but it's a relatively, you know, less processed food. It's still I mean, I'm sure orange juice just flies through our system. I'm sure it's got high glycemic index, but it'll kind of work, you know? So I'm going to pass these out as I talk. And the first three recipes are from, from Meredith. Um, they are a bar, um, a shortbread, strawberry shortcake, and, um, and a coconut macaroon. Honey and molasses, both as binding agents, for example, on the honey and molasses bars, and as sweeteners. So, um, for this, she's using um, sorghum or molasses, honey, butter, uh, flour, baking powder, three ingredients, and no sugar at all. Um, and you can make a judgment for yourself. That's the, the solid square. Um, if that's sweet enough for you, if not, she thinks it's a little bit too sweet. In which case, she'd want to substitute um, something else that has the kind of that binding liquid um, for some of the the volume of the honey and the molasses, something like rice syrup, for example. Um, the macaroons, um, her strategy was to cut out some sugar by making your own condensed milk, sweetened condensed milk, basically. Um, instead of buying a store-bought, um, you can make your own with vastly less sugar than a store-bought variety would have. Um, and then for the buttermilk by the strawberry shortcakes, again, as Pat was saying, you can add in your own amount of whipped cream um, to 
modulate your own amount of sugar content depending on how sweet you want it. Um, but again, she's using you know one tablespoon of cane sugar, or sorry, a teaspoon of cane sugar for the entire shortcake, and you know one two teaspoons for the filling. Um, and you know, it, when you portion that out, it's very little sugar per portion. She thought there was more sweetener in the bar than it needed to, and so. She said, but I felt like I needed it for a binder. And I said, then I would recommend going with the rice syrup. Much less sweet, not as many calories, but still really nice and gooey, good binder. You know? And she said to please mention that. I like it. I like sweet. <laughs> it's fine, but it is sweeter than it needs to be. You could have it be less sweet and still be pretty satisfying. The other thing I'd say with the strawberries, once again, if you were trying to feed a diversity of people, you could use way less sweetener and something like rice syrup for part of the strawberries and then something sweeter for, you know, and it, actually if the strawberries are really sweet, you could actually just mash them up a little bit and blend them up a little bit and have one totally unsweetened, you know? And then literally you could serve it using a little bit of stevia. You could just use a drop of another sweetener in your whipped cream and it'd be virtually no added sweetener to that dish. Plenty of fat in the biscuit though. You know, so there's always you know, um, a trade-off. But then some people like to have strawberry shortcake on sponge cake, and you could make a sponge cake with much less sugar. And that would also work if you like it that way. Those are the strategies that we use. I mean, they're, they're really straightforward. It's not hard. Um, you know, and I encourage you to really play with fruits. I mean, we have a fig tree, and I looked at those figs in the walk-in and thought, boy, I wish I'd seen those. I would have done something with those because they're naturally sweet high in fiber, and you can make something real sweet with them, you know? Um, and then just remember that other things are synergists that help to bring that sweetness forward, and that includes things like vanilla, cinnamon. I actually think that nutmeg has a similar impact too. That it just, you know, you notice all the flavors more with just a dash of nutmeg, just a little bit, you know? Um, and one of the cookies in the batches that ran I started to do nutmeg. I thought, no, that's confusing it too much. I want to be able to look at the recipe just like it was. But I would actually look at putting a little bit of nutmeg in a lot of these desserts. And it'll just make the less sweet more interesting. You know, it doesn't really, it's not like the vanilla and the cinnamon, I think actually helped it help you to experience sweet, sweet more. But the nutmeg, I think, just adds another item of interest that gives our tongue that, that you know, workout that we're wanting. So are there any recipes that you all have that are favorite recipes that you're trying to think about how to make less sweet? Well, I do make a, um, an oatmeal raspberry bar uh -huh. um, that uses brown sugar and sugar. Yep. It has, you know, like three tablespoons of flour, which I use a gluten-free flour now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would like to make that one maybe with honey or with something else. Yeah. And sugar. Yeah. It would be easier, the, the, if you're willing to go with it and like it, the rice syrup is gonna be easiest because it's less liquid, so you have to do less adjusting. You, know? you can probably, if you're ready to play with it, dial back the total amount of sweetener anyways, and then if you're using one of these liquid ones, there'll be less of the liquid, and then you just up your flour accordingly. And there's an article, one of the articles I have in there, I think, I think it's the one from Bastar University, but anyways, they actually give you formulas for that, you know? And the formula's pretty simple. If it's like, if you're um, using a liquid sweetener and you dial it back by a quarter cup, the recipe will probably still work, you know? So it's a quarter cup less sweetener, but you can probably do that pretty easily, you know? Um, you dial back, or dial back any liquid in the recipe by a quarter cup. I tend to do the sweetener because that's the one that I want to dial back anyways, you know? If you feel that you have to keep the liquid in, then you add more flour, and usually someplace between two tablespoons and f four or five, you know, something like a half, you know, two tablespoons or a quarter cup. If you're really, you know, these here I kind of thought to be safe, I had to add that fifth one in. I don't think I needed it. I think they would have been better cookies had I kept it at a quarter cup. But I needed to get them here. <laughs> I didn't want them running all over the, the tray again for another time. I'd run out of time. Um, and I think, that'll, I think you'll find that that'll work great, you know. Um, is the cost on all these about the same? Um, this, uh, right now at Trader Joe's is an incredible deal. Maybe it's on sale, but it was like seven bucks for that. That, that for me is probably a decade's worth of stevia. Mm -hmm. you know? That's a lot. <laughs> that, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. It literally is a decade's worth, I think. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll be giving it to other people. That's what I do. You know? About nine um, bucks each, I think. You know? The honey's 
less, of course, you know. Um, and the rice syrup, I think it's similar to these guys, I'm pretty sure, you know. Um, is it thicker than that um, agave? Yeah, considerably. The agave is actually, it's definitely, this is the thin, thinnest of the ones I have here, but the agave is pretty thin too, you know. And then this here, I have to confess, I needed to take a nap before I started baking. I slept longer than I wanted to. When I woke up, there were no stores open and I needed vanilla. So I went to Walmart, which I never do, but it was open. I had to go, you know, I got up at 12 or something, I had to go to Walmart and get it. And so they actually had this. I'm sure you can find it other places. I don't know if they have it downstairs, but um, they had at least three brands of coconut sugar and it was like four bucks. Well, that's, you know. that's saying a lot for Walmart, they have that coconut sugar. Yeah, it's, I, well, I, I think that people are moving away from, you know, the standard sweeteners for various reasons, you know, because they go, they go online and they, they see websites like Dr. Mercola or whatever, and, you know, for various reasons, they're just deciding that they don't want those standard sugars. So it's very low calorie, and yet it's got pretty comparable sweetness. I don't want to represent that these are good for us. I mean, these are better than processed sugar. Processed sugar, years ago, I talked to somebody that worked in those, I mean, they literally would think nothing of driving a bulldozer over the sugar piles, you know? Because it gets so processed down the road. It gets, it's made into nothing but pure um, sucrose, you know? It's just totally made to nothing else. So it's just, there's no minerals, no nothing. All of these have some modicum more minerals than that, you know? And that's good. And then they've got all potentially other benefits, you know? And you can read up on them. But they're still sweeteners. And your liver is still going to react the same way, and you just want to learn to you know keep that at a, at a level that is as minimal as it can be for you, and have you be satisfied. You don't want to deny yourself and then you know be driving by a convenience store and buy a Hostess Twinkie. You know, so you do want to find the balance. You know, but if you can do it, you can make it, make sweets with way less. You know, and then you know, and I really I like the idea of sweets as a celebration. You know, like. We'll often share a dessert if we go out to dinner, you know, depending on how, you know, how full we are. But if, you know, it's just part of the celebration. And if there's something that, you know, like for my birthday, we went to Buxton Hall and they had a scuppernong pie. And if I had time, I would have made it because the main sweetness was the cooked down scuppernongs, you know, that was the main sweetness, you know. And then they had some kind of cream on top that was sweetened, but it wasn't real sweet, you know, and they made a rye crust. It was an interesting dessert, you know, and that's, what I'm, when I eat out, I'm looking to have taste and experiences that I don't do at home. I can cook fine, you know. I don't like doing the dishes, but I can cook fine. I want to learn from when I eat out, and that, was, that pie was revelatory, you know, and that's something to think about. You can actually make, you know, another thing that I might have made if I you know, was going to make more things would be a blueberry pie, and I might have sweetened that with another cooked down fruit, not with, not with the classic sweeteners, you know. And... We try to pick the blueberries as ripe as possible so they don't need a whole lot of sweetener, you know. Um, but those kinds of dishes, you know, and you can actually then, you could also take the blueberries and just cook them down into a syrup and use that as a sweetener with more blueberries, you know. You just want to be careful. You probably want one of the diffusers on your burner, you know, because if you're trying to do that, or you could put it in the oven. That's a great trick, actually. If you're making jam, or I, I use it for making gumbo for the roux, but I learned from occasion to just take that roux and stick it in the oven. And it just slows down the whole process and you can still get it as dark as you want. Likewise, I mean, roux is not what we're talking about here, but likewise, you could take any fruit, put it in a, you want a, you don't want a small pot, right? A tall, small pot, you want a flat pan. So you get maximum evaporation as quickly as possible. You want a pretty low heat probably, like 325. You want to check it every 10 minutes or something. So you do it when you're in the house, but. You could be cleaning the house, you could be working on your computer, you could be doing anything, you know, you could be watching a video or something, if you can stop it, you know, just go take a look and you can cook that down to where you've made a syrup from your fruit and then you use that to both thicken your fruit a little bit and sweeten it, you know. So those are tactics you can use to make desserts that are not using as many refined sugars. And that's, that's about it. I mean, that basically is the class. I, unless you have questions, it's pretty simple, yeah. I know that the um, agave syrup in particular is supposed to be pretty unhealthy. You know, there's all kinds of discussion about that. I mean, it sounds like that from what it, the research I did on this, and actually, 
I've heard that too, so, but I, when I was looking it up for this class, it sounds like the big problems are more like how it's processed, and there's, even, there, there's so much demand right now, they're using an agave that's not blue agave. And so it is not really meant to be food for people. You know? So that probably is two of the reasons. You know, I've heard other discussions that the truth is, I'm sure if I looked long enough and hard enough, I could find something wrong with every one of these. You know? um, I recommend you know, having a diversity and using as little as you can. And that's pretty OK. And indeed, there was one, and I have it on. I mentioned there's an article on there, the, the, uh, sugar alcohols. Um, or alcohol sugars. Anyways, they're all made from things that aren't what we think of as sweet. I mean, xylitol is one. It used to be made from birch bark. Now it's made from corn husks. So the person writing the article, I really respect, they said, I used to use it. Now I don't recommend it because the corn is all contaminated with Roundup and GMOs. So what used to be something that he thought about using. But I was using one that had um, stevia and erythrol in it. Um, and I liked it a whole lot, and it really worked. It didn't have that ta aftertaste. I could use it as, you know, like sugar, and it was just great. And my partner was eating it, and she said, boy, this is too good to be true. I bet you if you research, there's something wrong with it. And I looked it up, and there's some one paper that talked about if you used a lot of it, um, it irritated the ileum or something. Some, you know, something in our stomach, you know, just it could cause a problem if you used a lot of it. And it's just like, okay, I don't need it, you know? I, could, I don't really, you know, like to eat things that aren't food that have been made, you know? I mean, I don't know if you all know it, but all of the, I think virtually, I think pretty sure all of them, the um, artificial sweeteners were discovered while they were making, while they were looking for pesticides, you know? <laughs> I mean, you know, scientists, you know, doesn't wash his hands, touches his mouth, to his, his finger to his mouth and goes, Wow, that's sweet, you know? I mean, you know. Um, I don't really want, you know, and years ago I had a friend who said, well, I don't see any problem with them having all the diet sodas out there, people want to eat it. I said, what I don't like is it teaches people to tolerate the taste of chemicals. And now we know that there's loads wrong with them anyways, you know? And so, likewise, these alcohol sugars, you know, they're not what we normally would eat. And I'd rather stay with things. All of these things somebody has used as a sweetener, you know? You can grow stevia. You know, um, you know, if you live in the right place, you could grow agave. Obviously, if you live in the tropics, you could grow coconuts. You know, rice. You know, honey. You know, all of those are ones that are natural. That's really the way I'm interested in doing it. I've used xylitol; it works. You know, I mean, the downside of xylitol is digestive stuff. And depending on your stomach, you, you may have flatulence, you may have diarrhea. You probably want to get used to it slowly if you're using it. It and one of these other ones now. I'm trying to remember which one it is. Um, it might be the erythrol one. Anyways, they are actually considered to be not at all a problem as far as cavities go because they're not really sugar. And so the bacteria don't really use them. So it's a plus that way. And it used to be that xylitol was the sweetener in gums. You know, before this, the artificial um, sweeteners came along, they, if you wanted to give your kid gum, you gave them a gum that had xylitol in it. And that's not very much. They're not digesting it, so they're not going to run into the, the digestive problems. But it was a good solution. So those guys are out there, too. I just figured, since I'm not using them much, I'm not going to try and talk about how to use them. Um, I did use the one. I was able to substitute it you know, one for one. It worked great until I read that thing about the irritation. Thought, I don't need it. You know, I can let go of it. But you might decide to go with that one. You know, it sounds like only one person thinks that's a problem. And even then, it's if you use a lot. You know. But I'm always like, well, what is a lot? And if I'm not paying attention, might it cause a problem? I'd rather not set myself up for that, you know? Or make something that somebody else that I'm feeding loves and they end up eating a lot. And then, so I just, I stay away from it. But those are also sugar, sugar substitutes that are not proven to be as scary as the artificial sweeteners, which I highly recommend. I mean, you probably all know that almost always those things cause you to gain weight. They don't cause you to lose weight. They cause you to gain weight, you know? They mess with your metabolism, whatever. And, and as I was reading this, and I've seen a little bit before, recently otherwise, there's also this whole thing about just being programmed to want sweet. So even stevia can set you up to eat too much sugar. You eat the stevia, and you just crave more sweets. So the response in the brain, the same pleasure receptors are being stimulated as when you use cocaine. 
So even though you may be eating something that has no glycemic index, it doesn't mean it's not setting you up to craze other things that, boy, have they got a glycemic index. So you're eating your stevia stuff out at home, and then you're out in the world, you don't have that, and you're craving something, and then you go for that hostess Twinkie again, or the, you know, whatever, you know, the Coke or whatever. So, you know, I preach a good line, and I do it for a while, and then I slip back, because I like sweets too. But it's really easy, if I just do it for a week or two, I can just stay away from sweets completely. And then Thanksgiving or Christmas, I'll have a piece, a piece here and there. And some years, I go right back to being healthy, but then other years, it's like, ooh, I slipped down that path, my receptor's getting fired, and next thing you know, I'm eating sugar again. I'm out in the world, and I'm buying some sweet that I don't need or whatever. But if you're trying to feed a family and there's a demand for sweets, I think these are great options. You can really help people to dial back that demand, get their brain less, you know. Oh, and that's the other thing, too. Just like with drugs, the more you eat, the more you need. You know, so it's, it's the same, you know, it is a drug, basically, you know, um, and we don't need it. I think that's about it, unless there's any other questions or comments. You haven't spoken any about raw sugar. You know, they're slightly better, but they're not massively better, you know. Um, I just find it easy to stay away from it. They all have pretty high glycemic indexes, you know. Yeah, it's definitely better. It's not quite as high a glycemic index, and there's some minerals, so it's better. But... I think you'd be better off to go with an alternative myself. You know, that's, that, that's my prejudice, and I do not claim to be a nutritionist. That, that's just my prejudice from what I've read, which has been very spotty, and I've read over the years. But I, if I see an article about that stuff, I almost always read it. You know, I'm interested, and food is my, is my life, basically, so sugar's a big part of it. So from what I've read, you know, I, I just have decided to stay away from them. I don't think there's enough difference. If I had, no, if I had to choose between Processed sugar and raw sugar, yeah, I'd go with raw sugar, absolutely, you know, yeah. I was going to say that nuts and popcorn and things like that help you stay away from mm -hmm. sugar. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Well, and the, really the ideal is to have a good garden and have the best carrots that you harvest it in cold weather. I just forget, you know, I could be like hooked on sugar, and if I just start eating those carrots, they're just like revelatory, you know, they're so juicy and crisp. And they're sweet, you know, and it's, it's a sweet, you know, sweetness really was a way that we told that food was good. I don't know if it's true, but one of the articles I was reading, and you'll probably run into it because I gave you all the links, said that basically there's no food that's sweet that's poisonous to us, you know. Maybe that's true, but even if it's not true, it was a general indicator that, you know, sweet meant good. And it also meant lots of calories when we needed calories, you know, I mean, when you're hunter-gatherers, you may go for 36 hours or 72 hours without food. So if you come across a bunch of berries, you eat every berry you can, and you carry what berries you can. You know? And so we're programmed to crave that sweet because it means, and likewise fat, it means the energy to get you to the next meal. That's definitely part of it. And indeed, the whole American obsession with the ideal body is totally warped. It's got nothing to do with what our genetic, you know, and if you're interested in that, it's an old book by now, but it was quite fascinating. It's called Fat and Thin. Um, and then there was something else, I think it was A Natural History of Obesity. And it was a fascinating read. The charts, you know, the insurance charts and all that, they're based on one European model. They're not even based on Mediterranean people. They're based on like, you know, Northern Europeans. And it's got nothing to do, you know, if you're from the Mediterranean, you're gonna have a different um, body mass index, you know, if you're, you know, if you're from the Polynesian Islands, you're gonna have a different one. If you're from Alaska, you're gonna have a very different one, you know? And so we have, you know, a standard set on us that's basically set by people who basically had the power. And so they decided this is how people should look because this is how we look. And it doesn't have anything to do with, you know, who we are. And indeed each, you know, sex stores fat in different places and, you know, Survival really depended on the ability to maximize, you know, what you could do with your with your nutrients. So the people who, you know, and so a lot of us have genes in us that are from people who naturally could store fat, you know, and that can be problematic if you if you draw like an unlucky hand. If both of your parents were good at that, you may, you know, people get judged for being overweight. They may just have much more efficient metabolisms than we have. You know, much more efficient metabolisms. Or they may have jobs that don't let them move around. You know, I mean, as I get older, I have to adjust because my metabolism is slowing down. But as a farmer, 
I could eat all I wanted. And I've actually set up the, the recipe, the menus, and guided um, chefs at various events for like 1,400 people, 40% of whom were farmers. And I had to always warn those chefs, you cannot imagine how much food these people eat. And they never did. They always would run out. I mean, finally now, years later, they're starting to get it. The word's gotten out. But farmers, just three desserts, no big deal. You know, they leave that conference. They're back out in the field. They're working like, you know, 10 hours a day, hard physical labor. Very different. You know, you're in an office, very different, you know. And so more of us nowadays are in that situation. So that's why trying to figure out desserts that have less sweeteners means we're more likely to keep ourselves where we want to be.